Supreme Court. My name is Grant Martoff. I am the um, chair uh, and the, the head of the uh, Health Service and Policy Research Hub at, at uh, Pitt Nursing. And this is our colloquium. We do this every, well, twice a month um, on Tuesday mornings. Um, the idea is to uh, promote uh, health services and policy research researchers both within the School of Nursing and then across the university and put um, uh, different researchers in conversation. One of our goals is really to be interdisciplinary. So in that spirit, uh, we've invited Julian Radikowski, who is an assistant professor uh, in the School of um, Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. She actually has a clinical doctorate in occupational therapy from UI Chicago. Uh, she is, again, an assistant professor, recently put in her tenure file. So um, we are very confident that she will soon, well, as, at least as fast as the tenure process goes, be an associate professor in the Department of Occupational Th Therapy. Uh, she and I worked together on a project through the Health Policy Institute, uh, which is run by Everett James, looking at the uh, Pennsylvania CARE Act. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about that today. Um, but that act is really focusing on helping uh, improve caregiving, particularly in hospital transitions in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, so Julian recently had a, an R01 funded through NIA, also focused on caregiving, and I'm very excited to um, invite her and welcome her to our cloakroom. Uh, also, Julian, let me know that you guys are welcome to ask questions throughout, but she'll be pausing intermittently to field questions, but, but we'll also have hopefully an extended time at the end for questions as well. So thank you, Julian. All right, I think you guys can see my screen. Yes. A little. Um, it's truly my pleasure to be here today. Um, like Grant said, I'm Julene, and I'm an occupational therapist by training. And my research training I got um, here at the University of Pittsburgh. And so for me, embarking on this project that Grant briefly mentioned of looking at caregiver caregivers within the UPMC system just felt like such a joy to like bring together some of my clinical training as well as the research training that I have within within our system. And the punchline of what I'm going to share is this that caregivers need to be identified, they need to be assessed, and they need to be trained. I think maybe that feels obvious like we you know can on a gut level say of course of course we need to identify our caregivers and train them um, but we kind of learned through this project that there's a lot of room for opportunity um, to grow that and expand that and think about how we can do that more effectively and so this project was um, a, a really wonderful collaboration between the wolf center at upmc the Health Policy Institute, um, and then as well as a, a group of researchers that are connected within the Health Policy Institute and, and otherwise. And it just felt like UPMC was coming together and wanting to know more, um, as well as the, the researchers at the University of Pittsburgh thinking we can better understand this and do this. So I'm going to give you a little background on caregiving to kind of like let you know how we got to the questions that we did um, within this study. And caregiving really got its place in society, um, thanks to First Lady Rosalind Carter. And this was one of her platform issues that she discussed when she was First Lady. And I think she has this wonderful quote that kind of exemplifies those ideas. And she said that there are only four kinds of people in the world, those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. And I think what she was really trying to get at is this idea that caregiving is pervasive. It's all of us. It's within all of us and all of our families. It's within all of our lives and it's something that all of us can identify with. But it is important to recognize that there are a couple different types of caregivers. So um, people will talk about caregiving experiences, but sometimes people might think about it as formal caregivers versus informal caregivers. And um, formal caregivers being clinicians who are trained, maybe home health aides or nurses or rehabilitation professionals. Whereas um, informal caregivers are the family members or loved ones or neighbors who are supporting someone in doing some kind of activity that they're doing. So in either way, um, it's caregiving. But when I'm talking about caregiving today, I'm really talking about the informal caregivers who are out there. 
and caregivers assist uh, a person in, in a daily activity in, their, in life. And it could be a variety of things that a caregiver assists someone with, whether that's um, medication management, scheduling of appointments, communication, and advocacy within the healthcare system, getting out in the community and doing activities that are meaningful to someone, or things that are happening within the home regarding daily activities, getting up and getting dressed. Um, and what's becoming increasingly acknowledged within the caregiving world is that um, it could be on site, but there also can be caregivers who are at a distance. And you can imagine that these are the, the daughters or the family members who no longer live close to um, their aging relatives. But there are a variety of factors that are making caregiving an increasingly common experience and um, something that is only becoming more critical in society than it ever has been. There are some um, you know, societal things where a greater proportion of our population is aging, where people are living up for a long time like never before. And there's a strong desire, especially across the boomers, for people to be living at home. And so this kind of um, triad of factors definitely lends itself to a longer caregiving career that people have. But the complexity of caregiving is increasing as well. And the complexity of caregiving is increasing for a variety of factors, including the idea that um, hospital stays are becoming short. And medical advances are really good at maintaining life, but um, maybe not as good at preventing the disability that people may have when their life is maintained. So you can imagine with people living longer, but not necessarily without more disability, that um, the need for caregiving is higher and will be coming higher, like, never, um, like something we've never seen before. And I would like to acknowledge that, you know, I kind of slip into a focus of um, caregivers for older adults, but of course there could be caregivers um, at all different life stages and they could be all different sorts of people. Um, so the top three there that I have um, among older adults being Alzheimer's disease and dementia, three or more chronic conditions and kind of end of life, the last six months of life, those are considered to be the most costly and high demanding. Um, caregiving experiences that people have, um, but there are many others to acknowledge, especially adults who have children with disabilities. So who are these caregivers? Caregivers have historically been the sandwich generation of women, the women who have young kids themselves but have aging parents as well. They tend to be unpaid, they're 45 years old, and they're caring for a family member or loved one. What's really interesting about this idea of the, of the, you know, the daughter or the daughter-in-law being a caregiver is that that is starting to change with more women being in the workforce um, and individuals having fewer kids than ever before, that there is starting to um, be recognized a shift in who these caregivers are that are out there. But um, so it is important to not acknowledge that caregivers really could be anyone and it's global. It's not just a Western world. Um, industrialized country phenomena. It's a global phenomena. Um, and within the US, that it's really about 16% of Americans are providing unpaid care to another um, caregiver who's out there. So I would like to pause here and kind of acknowledge that this is like kind of that epidemiology, like the pervasiveness of, um, of caregiving. And I'd love to hear if you guys have any questions about kind of this background idea of who caregivers are and what the role is of caregivers. Okay. So um, it is true that it has become more recently recognized that being a family caregiver can be a health disparity um, and that it affects health in the long run. And how it kind of happens is that it starts with sporadic care that someone has. Then it starts ends up being that, you know, a daughter or family member starts um, shopping for groceries for someone, maybe check picking up medications for them, maybe helping them put medications into a medication organizer, kind of more instrumental activities of daily living oriented. But at some point, someone starts helping with the more basic activities of daily living. 
until it kind of progresses over time to being um, a, a really involved caregiving experience. And there, the landmark paper that really exemplifies like the relationship between being a caregiver and mortality um, came from the University of Pittsburgh came from Rich Schultz and Scotch Beach, um, who are both housed within Uxer here at the university. They did this study where they looked at um, 392 caregivers and 427 of their matched non-caregiving peers. And they really, they looked for four-year um, mortality outcomes among the caregivers, not among the care recipients. And they found, found that caregivers who had um, a sense of burden, um, that they had a 63 times higher likelihood of dying within those four years than their non-caregiving controls. Something I wanna clarify this is that we're talking about burdened caregivers, caregivers who are having a hard time with their role as being a caregiver. And we can imagine all sorts of reasons why caregivers are burdened, that there's a lot of tasks that they have to do, that there's a lot that goes into it, and um, when a caregiver is burdened, it is truly problematic for their health. And um, this paper they had published in JAMA just for fun. Well, I'm telling you this just for fun. And um, so they, they published this in JAMA and on so many, um, you know, like the first line of a, of a caregiving article where it says like, you know, being a caregiver is problematic for health. You know, it's like Schultz and Beach from 1999. And um, a lot of individuals have kind of like tried to understand the, the breadth of um, caregiving work and how that influences society. And this is, I think, like the, the most clear way that I can depict that caregiving is big money. And that's the idea that in a year, that the amount of money that care, if, if we were going to monetize the tasks that caregivers are doing, that it would be basically equivalent to the amount of money <clears throat> that Walmart has as their income in a year. So the value of caregivers and what caregivers put into our society is almost incomprehensible in how, how much they are doing um, without pay. And so it's because of this, this recognition of how much caregivers do and really how much money caregivers are saying, saving our society, that um, sometimes people will say things like, caregivers are the backbone of our healthcare systems, or they do a lion's share of the, the, the nursing tasks within society because they are doing it on a daily basis. And so those caregivers are really helping our healthcare system that are then um, you know, integrating within those long-term services and support. And um, it was only a few years ago when this conversation around caregivers really started to shift and change and people started to think like, well, what, how much are caregivers helping our healthcare system? So we're learning that they're doing a lot. We know now that it's bad for their health and we're acknowledging that they're, um, that they're doing a lion's share of our things in our healthcare system, but what does that look like? And um, so I embarked on doing a systematic review and meta-analysis with some researchers here at the University of Pittsburgh. And we just looked for articles that included intervention studies that included caregivers within the hospital system to see, um, and then we tried to see how that influenced healthcare resource use. We ended up with 15 articles that looked at hospital readmission rates. And so we were able to parse it out in a few different ways. And this graph that I'm showing you here is by 90 day readmission rates. And what you can see from that effect size all the way at the bottom, even though it's teeny tiny, is that, um, that there was about a 25% reduction in 90 day hospital readmission rates among intervention studies that systematically included caregivers within the hospitalization process. So in this day and age where we're recognizing that preventable readmissions is a wonderful thing to reduce, we have a, a clear target. There's a clear thing being caregivers that we can try to better maximize to, um, to like try and reduce these readmission rates or unnecessary hospital use. And it was around the same time when AARP started 
came up with the CARE Act, which Grant mentioned in his introduction. The CARE Act is the Caregiver Advise, Record, Enable Act. And so what the CARE Act um, essentially suggests is that caregivers need to be integrated within the hospital system. And AARP was really strategic about this. They had their lobbying groups across, like across all 50 states push for the passing of the CARE Act. I couldn't find a more um, updated figure than this one, but I, I'm pretty sure now it's at 40 states have all within the past few years passed a CARE Act. And so they passed a CARE Act that has kind of similar tenants within it. Um, while there's state-by-state -state variation, the same three tenants are um, within all of the CARE Acts across the state. That they have a caregiver designation, so that's my little magnifying glass, that caregivers have to be identified, or that has to be an opportunity to identify a caregiver when um, a patient is admitted to the hospital. The second tenant is that a caregiver has to be called or notified that discharge will be happening, that there has to be a conversation um, letting the caregiver know that this individual is gonna be notified. And the third tenant that is across all um, care acts is this idea that caregivers need to be instructed on the care recipient needs. This is a pretty interesting one because like, what does that mean? What does that look like? And you know, there's a lot of state by state variation, but generally speaking, there is some kind of language across this idea of caregiver instruction or education that's required. So I'd like to pause again, and I'd love to hear what you guys think. Like what would be, um, you know, knowing that this is now something that is a policy within states and knowing that um, there's this acknowledged need to better understand how to integrate caregivers or study the benefits of caregivers. Um, let's generate some ideas of like what could be the value of this and or some ideas that would be worth studying. All right, you guys are gonna be quiet. I can tell you what we did. Um, we, you know, with this opportunity to embark with on the work with the, with the Wolf Center, um, we just thought, like, what does it look like? So, yeah, it would be awesome to be able to get to this idea of um, service utilization or patient outcomes or maybe even caregiver health outcomes. I think those are all, like, valuable avenues that really need to be um, embarked upon to study. But at the point when Grant and I had the opportunity to embark on this study, we just really thought we need to just understand what is happening and what is it that um, is currently um, occurring across UPMC as they try to embark on implementing the CARE Act and the tenants of the CARE Act. What was so fabulous about this opportunity was um, having the leader of the Health Policy Institute, Everett James, to be able to interact with the, the heads of the Wolf Center who knew that they were going to be in, making some procedural system-wide changes to adhere to the new law of the CARE Act. It was why not let's study it? Why not let's understand what's happening and um, see if we can better inform things that could be done in the future? And so that's really what you're seeing here as our project purposes to understand early implementation of the CARE Act across UPMC and to try and characterize what's happening with the caregivers within the hospital care with the hope that if we can get a good understanding of this that maybe there'd be um, lessons learned that could support other healthcare systems or could inform refinements that might happen to the CARE Act as a law. So that's what I'm going to kind of walk you through. I'm going to walk you through um, some big data of us looking at um, the, electronic, the electronic health records at UPMC, as well as kind of, we did, we knew that um, we also wanted to see, get our boots on the ground within the healthcare system and observe what was happening. So this is what I'm gonna highlight of looking at for the three main components of the CARE Act. 
related to identification of a caregiver, notification of a caregiver before discharge, and education or instruction for the caregiver. What does it look like within the healthcare data? And what does it look like on three different units within UPMC? Because we kind of thought if it's not in the documentation, maybe it's actually happening on the units and it's just not represented in the documentation. So we wanted to get both perspectives. I have a list of papers here that have come from this project. Um, Grant has a paper on this list where he looked at work performance among informal caregivers. And he did a review of the literature and he really found that um, caregivers have poor or work performance, but there's a lot of methodological issues within that area. But um, his paper was really well received within, among this group and within the, within the science base. But the two main articles that I'm gonna really focus on here um, that I'm going to show you some results from, I have highlighted there, and they were published in the Journal of Nursing Care Quality, as well as the Gerontologist. Okay, so he, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the components of the law, I'm going to show you what we found in the observations, and then from the data poll. So I'm going to do that for all three components of the CARE Act. So what the CARE Act says is that for the identification of a caregiver, that a hospital shall provide each patient, or if applicable, the patient's legal garden, guardian an opportunity to designate at least one lay caregiver. And this is upon admission to the hospital. So really it's this idea that when you're admitted to the hospital and you indicate who your power attorney is or you indicate um, who's making decisions for you in some way, that they also say, and who's the person at home who's gonna be helping you with daily activities. The intent of this um, component of the law is that then you know who we know as clinicians, who we should be training, who we should be telling that discharge is happening because it's documented within the, within the health record. And what we found when we um, observed 27 different admissions was that across 10 of them, or around 37%, that a caregiver was identified. But there's a big portion where um, those individuals weren't asked, that they declined, or they are missing from, um, from that process that it just, um, that, it, that, the, that it didn't translate from them be asking about a power of attorney to shifting to being a healthcare, um, being an informal caregiver. And that really highlights that there's a real opportunity upon admission to better explain, to better help people understand the value of identifying a caregiver. And this is really shown borne out within the big data poll that we did, where we had 13,000 different hits. And this is after, after implementation of having a spot in the record where a caregiver can be identified, where about half the time a caregiver was identified. But that means about half the time it didn't happen. And, um, and that really just shows that like, it's really step one in being able to effectively train and integrate caregivers and, it, and it, we have an opportunity to do more, to do better with that. So for the caregiver notification, AARP really wanted to have it be that, um, <clears throat> that caregivers had to be notified of discharge 24 hours prior to discharge occurring. And you can imagine that the, the health systems within each of the states advocated against that specificity in, in how long caregivers need to be notified before their, um, before their loved one is discharged because that really pins down systems to holding someone for a certain amount of time. So we don't have that. But we do have that a, a patient's caregiver should be identified or notified, excuse me, and that should be documented that the notification happened so that people know that the notification happened for that, for that patient. And in the observations that we had of 215 direct observations, we never saw that occurring. Unfortunately, our team never saw nurses or other providers, social workers um, calling the, the loved one to notify them of discharge. We don't think that means it doesn't happen um, because we know that a lot on units, there's a lot of social workers who are actively involved with family members. But 
what we're not sure of if there's that clear communication of this is when we anticipate anticipate it to happen. And what's really um, kind of aligns up with that is that it's not getting documented. Um, so in the data poll that we have of 7,000 um, discharge notes, that um, it didn't, it's not documented in 97% of them. So there's a few times when it was documented that the caregiver was unable to be reached. And it was documented a few times that they were notified that it did happen. But generally speaking, that clarity in the discharge disposition um, being identified and relayed to the caregiver, there's, there's, a, um, there's a lacking in um, being sure that it's happening in a clear and explicit way. The final part of the caregivers getting trained and instructed. I have this whole piece up here to kind of show the complexity of this component rather than us needing to go through the nuances of it. But really what it's saying is that like, do anything you need to do to train a caregiver. Just make sure that that instruction is happening. So whether that means that there's written materials provided or there's live or recorded demonstrations of what a caregiver would need to do. Um, and that there's really an opportunity for that caregiver to learn by asking questions and interacting with the healthcare professionals. And out of um, 215 of our observations, in 97 of them, some form of caregiver training was occurring, which is great. Um, which is a little less than half, but, but it was happening a fair amount of the time. And um, we broke it out by different types of caregiver training that would occur, because there is a literature base to suggest that doing demonstrations and then asking the caregiver to return those demonstrations back is a, is, um, a great way to enhance multiple modalities of learning that could really help a caregiver better understand what their critical role is gonna be in the home. And you can see uh, across those rows of demonstration and return demonstrations that those numbers and percentages are lower. And um, there, there was one area where, those, where that was most of the time implemented for a demonstration and return demonstration, and that was like in the scenario of diabetes when it was like clear that someone was having to learn how to do insulin shots and then the caregiver could um, demonstrate their ability to, to, to um, administer a shot. So that was um, a clear win of when caregivers were systematically involved. And what appears to be um, happening is that there's a lot of, oops, there's a lot of caregiver written instruction in verbal education that's provided at discharge. So it's kind of at this discharge time where that conversation happens in a formal way of like, this is what your loved one's needs are. This is what you can expect when you're going home. Here's a, write, a, here's a written handout of what that looks like. And I think like these numbers that are high here at discharge should stay high. That should be a summary thing that, ha that occurs. But these numbers that are happening earlier in the process, um, that's not happening as often. It seems like there's an opportunity there to integrate family members more when training may be happening. What we thought was really interesting about it is that we felt like training was happening pretty often based on our observations, but that doesn't mean it was always documented as happening. It seems like particularly a lot of the nurses did a really nice job of when they were in someone's room of including a family member in the conversation. That's not necessarily being documented as happening as often. So if you look at these middle, this middle section where they have the patient and caregiver being trained, um, you know that they have that happening at 19% of those interactions of when a caregiver was identified. Um, and so you can imagine that just happening within the flow of practice, but if it's happening within routine care, it, we should really be documenting the value of what's happening. Um, and I should also point out that it didn't happen where no instruction was provided within the, within the medical records. So instruction is occurring, which is good.
but not always with the caregiver. This is, um, this is a table from Cassie's paper that's in the gerontologist. And, um, you know, I think like I could, I could go through this, but you can really imagine the summary um, that like caregiver engagement appears to be critical, that there has to be some kind of assessment of caregiver needs, that using multiple caregiver training modalities um, seems like there's an opportunity to enhance that and improve upon that. And, um, you know, that this kind of idea that we need to be identifying them, we need to be notifying them before discharge happens, and we need to instruct in them and train them. And if we do these things, there could be an opportunity in the future to really understand that idea of what is the true value of caregivers and their integration into the system and how does that affect care recipient health, caregiver health, and healthcare resource use. And um, so this just really kind of highlights this idea that I think we, we have really moved, we're starting to strongly move away from the medical-centered care model and more strongly embracing patient-centered care. But perhaps the next wave of what's going to be happening in our healthcare system should really be patient and family-centered care or patient and caregiver-centered care so that we can fully implement the ideals of laws like the CARE Act, then also do right by our patients and hopefully reduce unnecessary hospital re, um, readmissions. Um, so, you know, this was my first slide and now it is my last slide that caregivers need to be identified, assessed, and trained. And we have room for improvement, but we're certainly making strides. Um, I feel like a question that I often get about this topic area is like, there's, um, you know, what the, what's the next step of the CARE Act or what happens after that? Um, you know, and I think there's, I, I really think of the CARE Act as like a, a wonderful launching pad to, for us to better understand the inclusion of caregivers, but certainly there's room for, room for improvement. And so with that, I would love to hear um, some questions or comments that you guys have. So we can go ahead and open up the floor so you can go ahead and uh, unmute your mic if you have any questions for Julene. Hi, Julene. This is Howard Dagenholtz. I have a question for you. Um, what is UPMC doing and have they incorporated the findings from this research into their practice? Um, I really appreciate you asking that question, Howard. It was like a wonderful thing at the start of this for the Wolf Center and UPMC to embrace this. And, um, and I feel like on the back end, UPMC really re recognized that there's maybe room for additional training or additional education on maybe the documentation side or maybe on um, their need to better um, make sure that some of these things that people are already doing is better clarified within the notes because they do believe that at some point components of the CARE Act are going to be part of their accreditation standards. Um, and this is like the honest interpretation. And so like it needs to be in the notes that, for example, the, that caregivers are notified of discharge. And if it's not in the notes, they could get hit on that. Um, and so UPMC is invested in making sure that these components of the CARE Act are better implemented across the system. Thank you. Hi, Julene. It's Laura Fenimore. I teach with Grant and um, several of the folks here on, on the call to, today at the school. And I, while I primarily teach doctoral students uh, about leadership, I also have an opportunity to teach some freshmen and nursing students uh, about key principles, uh, about things that they will need to incorporate in their practice. And it's clear to me that this is one of those topics that we should be discussing early and often and frequently reminding nurses uh, about. A couple of opportunities that I was thinking about is that this would be a very good 
nursing grand rounds for uh, UPMC, and um, I'm happy to connect you with folks who could make that happen um, in in today's uh, world from my contacts at UPMC. Um, but then I was also um, wondering from a question perspective, how this um, era of COVID land uh, is impacting the research and recognizing that um, the person who is able to come in to visit the person in the hospital may not be the caregiver and wondered um, how, how organizations have um, adjusted to, to that given the CARES Act. Um, thank you for that, Laura. It would, it would be my um, privilege to um, do this road show again. Like I, I just put it together, it's ready. So that would be no problem. And as far as the second idea related to COVID and what, what does that mean for caregivers? UPMC was really thoughtful in um, making sure that it was permissible for their staff to be able to do recordings of the, um, tasks that would be needed. Of course, this is with the permission of the patient and the clinician who's on the unit, but that they can do, let's say a recording of a transfer, or they could do a recording of the administration of some kind of medication or cleaning of the wound. And so there is room to use technology for training. How well that is done, I'm not sure. But I know that that um, opportunity exists within the system and within the regulations that UPMC has set for their clinicians to really embrace the, the passing of the CARE Act. Um, so that's a really interesting question and something I, I don't have information to kind of share that this is how it has actually changed. Sounds like another great um, project maybe for a DMP student. Oh yeah, and if I could add to that, I think um, you know UPMC has that opportunity for um, caregivers to interact within the patient portal as a designee for their loved one. But I think there's a lot of room for opportunity to enhance communication through that patient portal. And that might be too big, big of a project for a DNP student, but um, there's certainly opportunities there to think about resources and how those resources are communicated mm -hmm. um, to them and perhaps using those patient portals more than they're currently used. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maybe something else that I can share um, just as someone has a while they're thinking about another question. I said it maybe two years ago or a year and a half ago, um, Trump signed the RAISE Act. And the RAISE Act was um, his acknowledgement that um, Health and Human Services needs to come up with a strategy. If we have 40 states who have a CARE Act, that maybe it's time for their, um, Medicare and Medicaid to kind of have a uniformed policy that aligns with what the states are suggesting as being critical. And so the RAISE Act was um, to put together a committee that would come up with a national strategy. So the committee has been convened, but the um, findings from the committee have not yet been reported, but we can expect within the next, I don't know, year or two, that there will be some um, policies that will be suggested by this committee um, that lines up with the RAISE Act. So I think the national dialogue around caregiving is only gonna increase over the next couple of years, especially because it is a, a bipartisan friendly topic. It's one of the things that everyone can agree upon as being critical and necessary for our future. Um, so it, I think we will be hearing from the, about the RAISE Act and you can kind of trigger that this came from the CARE Act that AARP pushed across the states. So Julian, can you talk a little bit about the, um, sorry to change the subject a little bit, but about the R1 that you had funded and where that is? We, I know we have some graduate students and some assistant professors that might 
I uh, appreciate some insight of how that how that came about and how, how you you got to the point at which you were able to put in an R01 successfully. Yeah, um, sure. I have always, um, my NINR, the Nursing Institute, has historically been um, receptive to caregiving topics and funding caregiving research. So that's kind of been like the one institute that is um, traditionally receptive to the, to the needs of caregivers. I, when I was like creating some ideas that I would be interested in for, um, for an R01 and what that could look like, I kind of shifted my focus to be more about the patient rather than about the caregivers and the caregivers outcomes. And I was strategic in choosing that in the hopes that that would give me more of an opportunity to, to appeal to the traditional funding base across NIH. So my um, R01 is through NIA because it focuses on activities as an outcome for individuals who are um, within their within home, home and community based, and thinking about the types of services that could be a little bit more prevention oriented to support individuals um, in the community. But we can all acknowledge that caregivers are a critical piece, as I mentioned at the front of this, to being able to support someone in the community. So I really had an opportunity to combine both of my loves of thinking about older adults in the home and community and what are the most effective ways to support them. And um, so the other thing I had to do when I decided that I was going to be um, focused on a patient was to figure out a patient population that would be of most interest to me um, and that made the most sense. And so I decided to go with early stage cognitive decline. So at the start of this conversation, I suggested that um, dementia and Alzheimer's disease is one of the hardest caregiving experiences out there. And that the, um, you know, it's been pretty clearly articulated that um, it's costly as well. So there's a lot of room for improvement in thinking about the services that are provided. And so I'm doing an intervention study. I'm looking to see, can we help individuals who have Alzheimer's disease or dementia or in the very early stages of it, maybe right before that diagnosis, that we can help them strategize ways that they can maintain their independence. And a lot of times those strategies involve their family members or caregivers. And so it's just this recognition that it can't be an individual alone, that it has to be those who support them and love them for them to be able to stay in their homes for as long as possible. I would love to come and talk about that some other time. Yeah, well, this will be going on in, per in perpetuity, so I think you'll have plenty of chances to do that. Yeah, awesome. Any other questions for Jolene from the crowd? This is Haley Garamack. I'm one of those assistant professors in the School of Nursing who's trying to um, apply for R01 funding now. And I'm curious about the, um, uh, the path to putting that in, kind of like uh, building your team. How many publications did you have before you put it in? Um, good question. I had uh, one of my mentors. I like I, if I'm going to be completely honest, my, I did my postdoc training in geriatric psychiatry, and I had Chip Reynolds as a mentor for, for those individuals on the call who might know who Chip is. Um, Chip was my mentor. And um, I, you know, I went to him and kind of gave this like, Chip, I don't know what to do. Like, how am I going to do this? And, um, and so he, when I said like, this is like what I'm thinking you know, when I said, I, I think I need to focus on patients. I think I need to focus on a patient population and I'm interested in early stage cognitive decline. This is when he was like, well, you need a statistician, you need, um, you need a, a neurologist and you need a neuropsychologist. And I was like, okay, who are those people, Chip? <laughs> and so it really just came from like this idea that I, um, like clear, in, in hindsight, it seems so obvious that I need people who medically understand that population, who can interpret the neuropsychological exams for that population, and I can't do it alone. Like I need a statistician and a methodologist. And um, the only 
the person I'm mentioning that's on on that on that study as a, as an investigator is um, is someone who does imaging. So I have an imaging course in, of like looking at brain health. And um, and so that that was my team, and um, it really came from having a wonderful mentor who was able to like narrow it down for me. And how many publications I had, maybe I I had like a I did a preliminary. Um, trial of the intervention study and um, I my pilot data was really you know can I deliver an intervention consistently can I um, deliver this intervention in the community can I recruit the participants so I really went from a feasibility perspective for the for my pilot data I did have an effect size so I did have an effect size that suggested that um, it could be a meaningful um, intervention for individuals with MCI, but I did not publish a p-value within my um, within my um, pilot data, which is like what I'm trying to tell you. And um, so it was small pilot data, and um, so that was kind of the pilot data I had. That was my team that I had for it. And you asked about publications, and that I don't know off the top of my head. Um, so if, if you want to email me, I'd be happy to like look in my files and like give you a more clear, explicit answer, but I'm, I'm not sure right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to um, kind of share this, some of this work with you guys that I got to do with Grant. Um, it was, it was a fun project, if not stressful at times, trying to integrate um, the thoughts yeah. across many different groups of people in UPMC. Yeah, and one other thing to, to mention, too, is we do now, you know, Julene and I both have contacts at the Wolf Center. Uh, if any, everyone remembers the talk that was given by Dan Hall, Dan Hall is now, a, uh, he has a senior position there at the Wolf Center. That might be a good group to, um, to think about um, working with. They certainly have, they're very close to UPMC data so they're able to pull that relatively easily in a pretty expert way so if that's something that interests folks we can uh, create some connections there too so uh, Gra Grant yes this is Julius hey Julius hi I have a question for you Julian um, the university is moving into community areas right now like Homewood uh, the hill and probably Hazelwood or something like that how can you um, extend this study to those communities. Do you have any plan? Mm. Um, I think you're really getting at this idea that um, like caregivers in different communities, and I think there's a, there's an appreciation in our historical framework and thinking about who caregivers are and what caregivers need are was um, pretty homogeneous in perspective. But now we're realizing that caregivers' needs are very unique. There might be multiple caregivers. There might be caregivers that are near, and there might be caregivers that are far. And family dynamics look very different than they used to a generation or two generations past. And um, within the caregiving world, there's certainly a recognition that we need to think broadly about who caregivers are. And so if I were gonna say anything um, for work that needs to be coming next in the caregiving field, it's to recognize that there's probably not one caregiver. There's probably not one daughter. And there's probably not one daughter's needs anymore. That it's, um, it's gonna be multiple people. This is why we need to move to patient and family-centered care instead of patient and caregiver-centered care? It's a good question, Julius. Thank you. Any other questions? This is the last chance. Okay. Well, it sounds like uh, we've asked all of our questions. Um, I'm gonna thank Julian for this great presentation. Really appreciate you coming and yes, please, uh, we'll find another date for you to come back and talk about uh, your R1 work. Uh, just as a reminder, this is um, the, what is it? The second and the fourth Tuesday mornings of each month from nine to 10. Our next meeting will be 
and I'm hoping Amy will correct me if I'm wrong, October 27th. Um, and our next speaker, I believe, is Luke Sheehan, who's an assistant professor at Duquesne University. He's going to be talking about um, civic associations. Again, one thing we're trying to do here is sort of move beyond the healthcare delivery system, thinking about um, issues that, that affect sort of broader uh, civic life and how that might interact with healthcare and health policy and social policy more generally. So he is a political scientist and really interesting uh, thinker in terms of civic associations and the importance of that for human flourishing uh, in our life together. So uh, Amy, do I have that right? That's correct. Do do. Okay, great. All right, so and please, uh, we can uh, make Julian's email available if anyone has any questions. Obviously, you can find her um, on the PIT website. So thank you so much, and we'll see everyone in two weeks. Thank you.